I have found freedom for the first time in my life after over 20 years of struggling in uh, alcoholism and substance abuse, specifically meth addiction. And I am in recovery and I'm proudly in recovery. It's taken me a long time, a lifetime, actually, a lifetime of relapse, incarceration, um, trying over and over and over again to find this freedom. And I found it. I have found it. My childhood and upbringing was actually fairly normal. I grew up in a house, my parents were divorced, uh, but that's super normal, right? Most parents are divorced these days. <clears throat> and I didn't get heavily involved into alcohol until um, about my freshman year of high school. And that was when I first discovered that alcohol made me feel powerful. It took away some of the pain of some of the struggles that I had been experiencing. Um, one of the key moments in my life where things shifted for me it seems like we all have those key moments in our lives where something happens in our teenage years, and this is mine. My mom sent me to go live with my dad. I was 16 years old. I lived with him for about eight months, and um, I was a little wild. I was a little wild, and it was too much for my dad and my stepmom, and they sent me back to live with my mom. And the way that my 16-year-old brain interpreted that moment was that uh, I wasn't good enough and that I didn't deserve, you know, a better life, that I, um, that's the best way to say it, that I just wasn't good enough. And I dropped out of school when I got back to Texas after I had come back home to Texas and started drinking very heavily. I was hiding alcohol in my closet, and it was a very short time before I was doing cocaine on a regular basis. I did manage to enroll into college throughout that time period, but that didn't last because I was way too focused on, um, I was way too focused on having fun and drinking. And then there's a moment where it was no longer fun. And I think for people who don't have uh, addiction issues, um, that's when they stop. And I didn't have an off button. I didn't know that I didn't have an off button, but I didn't have an off button. And I got involved with meth at around 21 years old and very shortly started shooting meth right after that time and committing crimes to support my habit and that was just living that hard and rough lifestyle. It wasn't until I was 24 years old that things started to look up for me. I, through the midst of my addiction, um, got pregnant, which was an absolute saving grace for me. I had a, a little baby girl and was able to get clean and sober. Uh, and I stayed that way. I stayed that way for four years. I married her dad. We, we lived a life, and it was the very first time, really, since I was a child, that I was able to experience something that was stable. I relapsed, which is a, such a huge part of my story. And they always say that when you relapse, you go back to where you were very, very quickly. And it's so true. I can speak to that because that's happened to me every single time. And within a short amount of time, I was, again, living that hard and rough lifestyle, um, started selling drugs uh, in a way that I hadn't previously, uh, lost my job, and really started to get seated into a criminal lifestyle, if you will. The lowest of the low for me on my journey was when I had been um, using drugs and selling them for several years. And in 2011 was um, federally indicted by the federal government for conspiracy to distribute methamphetamine. I will never forget what it felt like um, 
they were chasing me on a, on a street in Denver, Colorado called Sixth Avenue. And I kind of make a joke and I say that they chased me down Sixth Avenue like I was OJ Simpson, but like that legitimately was what it was like. Um, I, they ripped me out of my car and, you know, had guns drawn on me and I'm on the ground and, you know, get the fuck on the ground, bitch. Um, they treated me as though I was a dangerous criminal. I was indicted. I didn't fully know what that meant at the time. Uh, I just knew, obviously, that I was being arrested. And it wasn't until um, I had been in county jail for, I don't know, a period of time where I finally understood what the words like federal indictment meant, um, that I was actually indeed going to be, you know, locked up for a significant amount of time, what that was going to be, who knew at that moment. Um, it's those moments in life, or in my life anyway, where... The rubber, the rubber met the road. I didn't want to live that way anymore. I didn't want to live in that darkness. And I knew in my soul that there had to be more. And I don't even think I knew at that time what that would even be. And I spent my time when I was initially locked up in county jail, um, really doing a deep dive into who I was, what, what my belief systems were, what I thought was even capable for myself, um, healing, mostly healing. And that, for me at that time, was a, a massively deep spiritual journey, or at least the, the initial parts of my spiritual journey, they began at that moment. And prison was super hard and challenging. However, the best experience of my life in hindsight. I can absolutely say that hands down now because I was taken out of the game and the life just long enough to where I could get some true sobriety. Um, I could get you know my head cleared and understand you know what was important to me. At that point, I had abandoned my daughter. I had abandoned her for drugs a relationship that I was in where I was highly codependent. And I didn't want to be that woman anymore. I didn't want to be that mother anymore. I just knew that I wanted to create a better life for her and for me. I was released from federal prison in 2013. So I did a little over about two and a half years in federal prison. And when I was released, it was really hard. I had spent two and a half years looking forward to this time when I'm going to be released. You know, it's, you know, what am I going to wear? And all of these things, it's this brand new, beautiful beginning. And it wasn't beautiful. It was really, really, really hard. I couldn't find a job. People wouldn't employ me. I struggled to, um, well, to do anything. I literally had $100 to my name. And when you have a halfway house as your home address, it's hard. That was probably the, one of the darkest times of my life was living in the halfway house in Denver, Colorado, um, trying to figure out what are my marketable skills. My teeth have now since been fixed, but they didn't look the way that they look right now. Um, they looked like I had been doing meth for 15 years. And my self-confidence was that how about is less than zero. There was no self-confidence. I didn't believe in myself. What I knew for sure was, was I had several felonies, a long criminal history, I lived in a halfway house, and no one would hire me. That's what I knew. I understand why the recidivism rate is as high as it is because of the barriers and the challenges that are associated for those who are coming out of incarceration. It is... It's a struggle, to say the least. I finally found a job uh, and got heavily involved. I just felt my face shift when I said that because it's so true. I can feel it in my soul. It's almost like I can go back to that moment, you know, a decade ago. Um, and I got heavily involved with an organization nonprofit called Dress for Success Denver. And even to this day, I mean, you can visibly see me getting emotional because of how much they impacted and supported me when I had been released from incarceration. They provided me with clothing and, um, and a career coach who taught me how to speak about myself and try to market myself, helped me with my resume. And through that process, I was able to get a job. And if I, it's almost like if I didn't smile big enough and people didn't see my teeth, right, um, 
but the outside looked the part, okay? The outside looked the part um, that I, the, then I, I was marketable, right? And I did, I got a job. And then started my journey, right? Uh, once I, I got a job, I was able to get in and prove myself because I am highly driven, uh, to, to put it lightly. I am the kind of person that um, when I am focused on um, my goals and the things that are important to me, I'm on fire. When I am making bad choices in drug addiction and struggling, struggling in darkness, we're going all the way, right? It's, it's, it's either one road or the other. It's kind of like no middle ground, right? Um, and life got better. Life absolutely did get better. Uh, I didn't know this language then, but I know it now. And the language is emotionally sober. After eight and a half years of being clean and sober, but not emotionally sober, so not really working a program, you know, I was trudging through it and doing it on my own and quite frankly, using achievements to show the world my value. So just like when I was 16 years old, right? It's, it's the same thing, right? It's that same battle for half of my life, even longer than that, right? Well, hopefully I'm gonna live to be a spry 90. But it's that same challenge of trying to look for my value in other people. And I did that after my release from incarceration. I needed people to understand me and accept me, right? And so I ran marathons and I worked myself to death and I did these things that, um, that, try, that I was trying to prove to the world and quite frankly myself that I had value. And in 2019, I relapsed, which in my world of being the sober girl who made it out of prison, that felt like the worst thing in the world that could have happened. You know, now the persona is shattered and, uh, you know, and what are people gonna think about the sober girl? Um, the, these are all the things that are in my head, right? Um, you know, relapsing. And I went to rehab in California and at some point through that process, that 30 day process, it didn't matter anymore. It didn't matter what other people thought about me. <sighs> when I went to rehab, I was training for the New York City Marathon. And when I relapsed, I had been training and um, I used math for exactly six days, exactly six days. And my friends who helped me get into rehab had to push me in a wheelchair. When we got to the airport from the like security to the gate because I couldn't walk. You know, I had taken what I had done to my body within six days blows my freaking mind. You know, when I say I don't have an off button, I don't have an off button. And this is life or death for me. And interestingly enough, um, just yesterday, a friend of mine reached out to me to let me know that um, someone very close to me had, had died over the weekend. Um, uh, f and she just wasn't able to, to get her addiction. Um, you know, and that stuff rings very clear, very clear and true to me because this many steps in this direction and that's me. Right now I'm this direction, right? And so here we are filming this. But it is life and death and I have to do things on a daily basis that take care of me. Uh, and it's very clear program now that I, that I work for myself that have been absolutely life-changing for me. Um, once I went to rehab and stopped living in my ego of what are people going to think about me? Um, I need to show the world that I'm valuable and that I have worth beyond having felonies and struggling with meth addiction and being incarcerated and all these things, these badges that I wore on myself, right? Um, it's like 
at the, in that moment, I, I shed all of that. And I got out of rehab or started to shed it, right? It doesn't happen like this. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a process, right? But at least that relapse provided an opportunity for me to get honest with myself, be desperate enough for change, but most importantly, drop the ego that my, that, that my brain was telling me that it mattered what people thought about me and two, um, that I had to show the world, right, my value. I needed that, I needed that relapse and it was the best time of my life. <laughs> And also the hardest. Um, you know, I'd been to rehab. I lost another job, right? Like, and God, what a beautiful experience that was. Uh, you know, I got to share with my daughter, um, hey, I relapsed and I'm, and I'm sorry, um, but I'm coming back. And then I came back, right? Um, I started to work a 12-step program very heavily after I got uh, home from rehab um, about three and a half years ago. And that process has given me so much freedom from the things that I have struggled with, with my entire life. On top of that, I became heavily obsessed with my ability to change my life through the way my thoughts work something magical happened inside of me when I understood that I am the creator of my, my, own, my world. I am the creator of my day today. I am the creator of my day tomorrow. I'm the creator of my day yesterday. It was like, and taking that control and knowing that now, it's like I literally am unstoppable. I spend my mornings um, intentionally calibrating and connecting with um, my trusted source. Uh, I meditate. Um, I'm heavily, uh, I use the word obsessed, but it's just so true. I'm obsessed the way that my brain works and how, um, how I can put my brain and my heart into coherence and create vibrations and energy around me and affect the collective consciousness, right? Um, share with other people love. I've spent so long with everything being just about me. You know, as those of us who struggle in addiction, we're inherently selfish, and it's not a, it's not a fulfilling way to live. And the most freedom and happiness that I, I could ever experience or that I experience in my day-to-day -day is being able to um, just share my story and give joy to someone and let them know, hey, you know what, I've been there. You know, and I've been there in a big and dirty way. And I got out of it. And right, you can too. You know, these are the things that I, that these are the steps that I took. When I lived in the halfway house, there wasn't a model for success. There was not a model for success. If I can show that model for success of, hey, I know it's hard right now, but if you keep going it, on the other side of it is this. Just something to hold on to. And, it, and you know, that story isn't just exclusive for those of, of us who struggle in, in, with substance abuse or alcoholism, right? I mean, that's universal. We all need to see someone who's made it out of whatever we've made it out of, cancer, um, eating disorders, right? All of those things that we struggle with, right? It's just so uh, ingratiating and loving when we can share our stories with one another and pull some of those details. Um, I need that, right? I need that and I utilize that in my day now. I look at my models for success people who I really, really look up to. Uh, and I'm like, okay, I want to be like this. I want to be like that. And I implement those things into my day to day now. Um, because today I have goals. Today I am a woman who knows that, um, that anything is possible for me. And I live without limits. And those limits were only there uh, put into my own head by myself. It's all bullshit. It's all bullshit and it's not true. And once I've shattered those, those thoughts and those thought processes, that's the freedom that I talked about at the beginning of this video when we started talking today, right? Is I have a freedom today um, that I've never had. My, my daughter is now 19 years old. 
And I'm not going to go into the details of some of our struggles, um, but as you can imagine, she's had a pretty tough, a tough go of it, much tougher than I ever had. And so much of that is because of my choices. And she is now 19 years old. And she moved in with me uh, about seven months ago. I can't change the past. But we are rewriting our future and it's the most beautiful experience of my life. The legacy that I am able to leave, leave behind is one of a woman who really messed up in a big way, but never gave up. And now I'm affecting my life and her life and our family's life as a whole. And we cook dinner together. And she tells me, Mom, I look up to you. She deserves the very best. She is the reason the way of why I work as hard as I do. Again, I can't, I can't change the past, but we are rewriting the future and it's the most amazing experience. I can safely say one of my greatest accomplishments as a woman and a human being at this point is that I am a good mother. And that's a big deal to me because for so long I wasn't. It's important to me to be as authentic as possible with my story and be as vulnerable as possible because I, I, I want for people to understand truly where I came from. It's easy to show up in my life now and I hesitate to use the word pretend, but um, with certain people in certain situations, uh, I absolutely want for people to really understand from, a, from, from the real place of where I've come from, because it's a big deal. <laughs> you know, it's a big deal. If I would have stayed on the trajectory that I was on, I would be dead or I would be incarcerated. Uh, or let's just say I would have made it through both of those things at this point. I would be homeless or I would be committing crimes in some other way, right? Like, uh, that would be my life. I'd probably be dead. But instead, I get to live with my daughter in this beautiful home and we get to share these amazing moments. And I have friends today and friend groups that, I, that I've only dreamed of. You know, I, I am so obsessed with self-development and I get to participate in all these conferences and organizations with these amazing women, women who I never knew existed. There was a time in my life when I thought that these women wouldn't be my friend. That is not me today. Of course, of course they want to be my friend. <laughs> I say that in a funny way, but it's true, right? Like, I am a good friend to people today. I, I get to live this amazing, amazing life um, that <laughs> I, I couldn't dream. I, my, I absolutely love what I do for a living. I love the people that I work with. I love the company that I work for. I wake up and it's like my dream life. And every single day it just keeps getting better and better and better. It's never been like that for me. And I would tell you, I, that the takeaway here is once I took accountability for everything in my life, the good and the bad, all of it, every inch of it, once I took accountability for everything that was happening and understood that I could shift it and shift it in a big way, oh baby, like that's the good stuff. That's the good stuff. That's where the freedom is found. And it all, all of it in many, many ways points back to not in many ways, in all the ways, points back to alignment.